Hi folks, Canadian Prepper here. Today we're going to talk about what are the best and absolute worst large urban centers to be in after it all goes down. Let's get to it. Under the right circumstances, with the right resources and knowledge, anywhere is survivable after the collapse of society. Technology like vertical farming, geothermal greenhouses, renewable energy sources leveraging solar, wind and hydroelectric, even solar heating are all protective factors against a collapse scenario. But the fact is, these are assets that most people don't possess. So let's use some standard criteria to assess what cities are going to be most survivable after it all goes down. In order for people to survive, we need clean air, we need water, we need food, and we need the right climate to live in. A city is no different. Here are some factors to consider when assessing how ready your city is to survive collapse. What is the altitude and the proximity to a coastal region? Is it a low-lying city that is prone to flooding and natural disaster? What is the proximity to a fresh water source? That is, does your city rely on energy intensive water transportation and purification processes? What is the climate of your city? Does it require a lot of energy to heat everybody's homes in the winter and air condition it in the summer? What is the population density of the city? Note that the key word here is density. It's one thing if you live in a city that has 2 million people and half of them live in suburban lots with 0.25 acre properties. It's another thing if everybody is living on top of each other. What is the terrain like and the accessibility to and from the city? Are there many ways out in case of an evacuation order? What are the resources and food availability within short distance of the city? Is it largely self-sufficient or does food need to be trucked in from thousands of miles away? What is the energy it's dependent on? Solar, wind, hydroelectric or nuclear? Is it in a natural disaster prone region? Would it be the subject of earthquakes, tsunamis, tornadoes, hurricanes? Is it close to nuclear facilities which may become hazardous if they couldn't be maintained in a collapse scenario? What is the proximity of the city to a national border? Would the city itself be a nuclear target? What are the geopolitics of the surrounding regions? Does the city contain or is it close to a military base? And lastly, is it a city from which a lot of government operations are conducted? That is, is it a provincial, state or even national capital city? Using these criteria, let's assess which cities in Canada are best suited to endure in their current form the decomplexifying of society. Note that while the primary focus of this video is on Canadian cities, these inferences can be extrapolated to all cities throughout North America and the world for that matter. Starting on the west coast, there's the capital of British Columbia, which is located on Vancouver Island, Victoria. We've rated Victoria an 8 out of 10. The reason for this are the following. It's a temperate climate which is survivable year-round, without the need for heating or air conditioning. It is a self-sufficient island which is heavily wooded, and it has a very long growing season. It ranks level 9 on the Plant Hardiness Zone rating scale, which is the highest in Canada. You also have full ocean access and a low population density. Some of the cons of living on Vancouver Island would be that in order to access the mainland, you will need a boat. Currently, Victoria has been rated one of the worst cities in Canada as far as crime rate is concerned. Whether or not these problems would carry over post-collapse are unknown. There is a small risk of earthquakes and tsunamis, and of course, mountain lions will certainly kill you. Vancouver has been rated a 6 out of 10. There's a temperate climate which is survivable year-round. They have fresh water from abundant reservoirs. The land is fertile and can grow an abundant amount of food and it ranks as a level 8B on the plant hardiness zone which is among Canada's highest and there are lots of places to bug out to in the surrounding regions. Some of the negatives, however, is that this is where the highest population density, second only to New York, is in North America. Metro Vancouver has a population density of 13,590 people per square mile. Vancouver tends not to be a culture of preparedness. 
Many people here are hopelessly dependent on critical infrastructure. Another problem with Vancouver is that there are a few ways in and few ways out. It's a very rugged terrain and evacuating this city would be an absolute nightmare. It unfortunately has the highest per capita drug use in all of Canada. And it is very close to the US border, which is a street called Avenue Zero, which means this could potentially be a very busy border corridor after disaster strikes. Considering that just a stone's throw south of Vancouver is the greater Seattle area, which has a population of almost 5 million people. And lastly, in the case of a global conflict, Vancouver may well be a nuclear target. Moving into the interior of British Columbia, Kamloops we rate as a 7 out of 10. This is a fairly geographically isolated town in couch between mountain ranges. It is an arid desert-like climate but does have abundant water sources. And there's also a longer than average growing season compared to other parts of Canada, ranking level 6 on the plant hardiness scale. Currently, there is also a very low population density. Some of the negatives of this region is that it is in one of the greatest forest fire prone regions in all of BC and is only a stone's throw away from where the recent record was set of almost 50 degrees Celsius or 121.3 degrees Fahrenheit in Lytton, BC. In spite of the fact that there is abundant water sources, without the energy required to control irrigation, growing crops might be challenging due to limited rainfall. This is also one of the hottest regions in Canada. They do have moderate but survivable winters. And lastly, if you stray too far from town, there's a lot of bears that will probably kill you. Up next is the city of Calgary, which we rank a 6.5 out of 10. The benefits of living in Calgary is that there is a higher than average gun ownership rate, which is indicative of a higher than average culture of preparedness. The winters can be periodically tamed by Chinooks, which are warm blasts of air which come off the mountain ranges from the west coast in the wintertime. Although there is a high population in the city as a whole, it's very well spaced out with a low population density in a suburban sprawling city that's not very congested. There is lots of animal husbandry in the surrounding regions, as this region has some of the most livestock per capita, ensuring that there would be a food source post-collapse, at least for a short time. In contrast to Vancouver, there's a lot of ways in and out of the city. There's a very open and varied terrain which can be hilly in some parts, but among the most easily traveled in Canada. Here you'll find yourself at the intersect between the mountain and grassland biomes, providing a multitude of climactic options within short distance. There is also a larger agricultural focused community, and with that is going to come a lot of know-how. Some of the negatives of Calgary is that indeed there is a substantial population. Without a way to heat your home in the winter, it would be challenging to survive here. In wintertime, snow may make some roads impassable. And because the city was built in a grassland climate, access to firewood will be difficult without some form of transportation. Moving westward, there is a city called Saskatoon, which we rank a 3 out of 10. Some of the benefits of living here is that there is a low population density. There is access to a river, which would be a source of abundant fresh water. Although the city was built in a grassland swamp biome, there is access to the boreal forest about 100 kilometers north of here which could be a bug out location post collapse. And one of the last benefits is that it's one of the most northerly yet least densely populated cities in all of Canada. And it likely won't be a nuclear target, but you never know. Some of the negatives are that it's one of the worst cities in terms of crime in all of Canada. It has one of the most unsurvivable climates in all of Canada. In the winter time, quite frankly, without proper heating, most people won't survive here. And because it's not immediately close to a wooded region and relies primarily on natural gas, there will be few options for alternative heating. Moving eastward, we hit Winnipeg, which we rank as a 3 out of 10. It is the geographical center of Canada, which makes it the farthest from the east and west coast. There also is abundant freshwater sources within throwing distance in spite of the ongoing historic drought that farmers in this region are currently facing. Unfortunately, the cons of living here are that it's one of the worst cities for crime in all of Canada. They also have some of the coldest winters in Canada, and this place simply would not be survivable for hundreds of thousands of people that live here in the winter time. 
it is closer to the boreal forest tree line than is Saskatoon and thus may afford people more evacuation options, particularly in the winter time. Moving eastward to Toronto, we rank a 3 out of 10. Some of the benefits of living around the Toronto region, which is below the 49th parallel, between the Toronto and Windsor corridor is some of the most fertile land in all of Canada, ranking up to a level 7 on the Plant Hardiness Zone Index. There would be unlimited fresh water from the Great Lakes. In the case of an emergency, there are much more evacuation routes and options than there are in a place like Vancouver. And there's also an equal amount of bug out locations in places like Algonquin Park and other Northern Ontario destinations. In addition, there's going to be a lot of government resources allocated to this region if there ever was a major disaster. Some of the obvious cons are that this is one of the most densely populated places in all of North America. In addition to that, it's smack dab in the center of what some call the Great Lakes Megalopolis. A place which supports populations of almost 50 million people including many American cities like Milwaukee, Chicago, Cleveland, Detroit, Buffalo. And thus, in the case of an all-out nuclear exchange between superpowers, this would definitely be a nuclear target. All of the four nuclear power plants that Canada has are within spitting distance of Toronto. The spent fuel rods at these facilities and the facilities themselves may become hazardous if not properly maintained after disaster strikes. This is not counting the dozens of nuclear power plants which pepper the eastern seaboard. A neutral factor of this region is the cultural diversity. Toronto is one of the most multicultural cities on earth. This could be an asset or a hindrance depending on how things play out. Linguistic, cultural, and even ethnic similarities may have some benefits when it comes to local neighborhood by neighborhood governance. But these same things could lead to tribalism and conflict within the region. Next is Montreal which we rank a 4 out of 10. Being at the mouth of the St. Lawrence River provides river access, and may remain an abundant hub for trade even post-collapse. There will be abundant water sources here, there's a relatively longer growing season, endless access to the boreal forest. Montreal is largely reliant on hydroelectric power which may still be operational post-grid down. They also have access to heavily wooded regions as a source of heating fuel in the winter time. Some of the negatives is that for a Canadian city there still is a high population density. It could be a potential nuclear target and it is close to all those other eastern hazards that we discussed with Toronto including nuclear power plants. The winters are going to be slightly colder than Toronto with a bit more snow. In terms of demographics there may also be bilingual tension between English and French speaking people after disaster strikes. Moving eastward we go into Newfoundland which we rank a 6 out of 10. Because it's so geographically isolated, we've decided to talk about the island as a whole as opposed to any specific city on the island. This is an island maritime like climate which is mostly temperate. There's a low population density. It's the closest geographically to Europe which may be a good or bad thing depending on what the situation is. There are thousands of tiny islands which pepper its coastline. Winters would be rough but survivable here. There's a large fishing culture here with a moderate growing season. It's a heavily wooded area and there is a lot of large game to hunt. Now some of the downsides of Newfoundland is that there is going to be extreme eastern coastal weather which could lead to lots of snowfall in the winter time and make travel difficult. And without a boat you're essentially landlocked. But overall, this place has a higher than average survivability of most Canadian places. Up next is the province of Prince Edward Island, which like Newfoundland isn't its own municipality, but isolated enough that we're going to assess it as a whole. We rank Prince Edward Island an 8 out of 10 in terms of survivability post-collapse. There is a very low population density here. Only 150,000 people here in a place the size of Long Island. Long Island has 7.5 million people, so you can see it's a much lower population density. Prince Edward Island has over 86,000 acres of potato farms, which of course would be a staple famine food post-collapse. The island also has a total land area of 1.4 million acres. Much of this land is arable. There's abundant lobster and oyster fishing. 
and 30% of their electricity is wind generated. There is also a moderately long growing season, ranking level 6 on the plant hardiness zone scale. There is a moderate but survivable winter without inordinate amounts of energy inputted into the system. Some of the negatives is, is that there is only one bridge that links Nova Scotia with Prince Edward Island. This could be a good thing or a bad thing depending on the circumstances. Another negative is that they are going to be heavily dependent on ground water, as there are not a lot of fresh bodies of water. There's not going to be any large game on the island, most were hunted to depletion, so you'd be reliant on animal husbandry and fishing for your protein sources. There would also be limited forested regions for firewood, but because it's such a low population density, this wouldn't be a problem, at least in the early phases. The cities discussed in this video are but a handful of Canadian cities. The top ranking places to be would be Prince Edward Island and Vancouver Island. Let me know in the comment section below if there is a town or city where you live that would rank very high in terms of its survivability post collapse based on the previously discussed criteria. I really look forward to reading your comments. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe if you enjoy this video. Canadian Prepper out. The best way to support this channel is to support yourself by gearing up at CanadianPreparedness.com. The best quality products at the best prices. Use discount code SURVIVALPREPPER, all caps, all one word, for 10% off. Thanks for watching. Stay safe.